please welcome our amazing speaker, Chloe McAteer. Chloe McAteer is a senior software uh, engineer at Hamilton Robson. She has experience working on small research prototypes using cutting edge technologies, right through to building large scale web applications using multiple technology stacks. Chloe is an active member of the global tech community. She has been an AWS community builder for the past three years and is also a former Belfast city lead for Women Who Code. Chloe uses these outlets to share her learning and experiences through blogs and other events. Thank you, Chloe, for being here today. I will now pass the session over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I am just going to share my screen here. Let me know if you are able to see it okay and let me know if you can hear me okay as well. Let me just share my screen. And I'll put this into presentation mode. Yeah, can everyone see the screen okay and hear me okay? Perfect, thank you all. So hi everyone, I hope that you're having an amazing day so far. There has been so many incredible talks today and I know there's other sessions at the same time as mine. So thank you so much for joining this session. I love seeing your messages in the chat, so feel free to keep them going throughout. And if you do have any questions at any time, just pop them into the chat and I'm happy to go through them at the end. Um, I hope that you find this session interesting and fun. And so without further ado, let's jump straight into the history of ID verification. So since the dawn of time, there has been many forms of identity verification. Some early examples were as simple as somebody you know being able to recognize you in a crowd. Throughout history, we've seen people use things like jewelry or even tattoos to identify their bloodlines or their tribes. As societies advanced in written language, some key identity enhancements started to evolve. In 3800 BC came the first census. In 14 AD, the introduction of personal documents, such as birth certificates. In 1414, the creation of the first passport can be tra traced back to King Henry V. In 1840, came the first forms of photographic ID. And it wasn't until 1977 that the US government created a program for cross-referencing ID. But where there's opportunity, fraud will always follow. A recent survey from HealthNet Security shows that identity document fraud has increased by 57% since 2020. In today's world, some countries have advanced biometrics in place or smart identity cards. However, we still very much have a reliance on a lot of paper-based documents. Now, paper-based documents worked extremely well in a traditional brick and mortar business environment. But with businesses and societies undergoing massive digital transformation and the rise of e-commerce and social networking, it's not a surprise that the creation of fraudulent documents and identity impersonation is at this all-time high. I'm sure everyone here has experienced some form of identity fraud, either directly or has seen it happen to a friend or a family member. It could have taken the form of having your own document stolen, someone impersonating or catfishing online, or even financial identity theft. Although the type of identity documents have changed rapidly over the years, the way that we verify these documents has not accelerated at the same speed, and most checks still involve some form of manual face-to-face -face verification. Today's identity documents can still take on a lot of different forms, especially across different countries, different sectors and different industries. However, some popular examples include passports, driving license, national ID cards, recent utility bills and even financial statements. Overall, the pandemic has accelerated the drive and need for remote digital identity services. In the graph on the screen, we can see that the digitalization of consumer interactions has accelerated by several years, just within the space of 2019 and 2020. 
When it came to people needing to take out a new bank account, starting a fully remote job, or even taking out a new insurance plan, during the pandemic, there needed to be a way to verify people without having to see them face to face. From banks and recruitment right through to e-commerce, identity plays a part in almost every aspect of our digital economy. An example of how the pandemic has changed identity verification, increased the, the drive and need for remote digital checking services, and made a positive impact can be seen through the UK government. So pre-pandemic in the UK, all employers had to carry out face-to-face right-to-work checks with all of their employees in order to verify their identity documentation. Failure to comply could result in fines of up to $25,000 per worker. But when the pandemic hit, necessity brought change and temporary measures were introduced to allow employers to digitally verify worker documents using a new trust framework. Since its success, they have decided to extend the programme and have introduced a new office of digital identity attributes and they've also released more detailed documentation and standards for services to comply with. With this increase in need for identity services to assist companies, it leads quite nicely into what I have been working on. So a wee bit about me and what I have been working on. So hi, I am Chloe. As you can see, my name is either Macari or Macateer across different platforms or accounts at the minute. Uh, that is because I've recently got married, so there is just a little bit of inconsistency with my name, but it is Chloe Macquarie. I am a former Belfast City lead for Women Who Code, and I absolutely love our local Belfast chapter. It's so great getting to see so many of you from different chapters around the world today. So definitely let me know in the chat what uh, Women Who Code chapter you're joining us from. I'm already seeing the congratulations messages come in from everyone. Thank you so much. But currently I am an AWS community builder and I am a senior software engineer at Hamilton Robson. I've been with Hamilton Robson for just over a year now. And we are a technology company that deliver digital services across social media, finance, visitor attractions, manufacturing and construction. Recently, I've been working with a client that is on track to disrupt recruitment in the construction sector. A key part of that mission is enhancing the overall authenticity, security, efficiency of verification on a range of physical documents all at scale. Each verification process that we are creating for these physical documents have their own business rules, escalation paths and asynchronous integrations. But since a passport is a universal document that most people should be familiar with, I'm going to use it to do a more detailed dive into how we identified what checks to run, some of the issues we faced and overall the technology that we built it on. We did do a similar approach for all other document types, but I don't really have time to take you through all of the documents today. So I thought passports would be a great start. So passports can be used as photo identification but also contain information such as your full name, your birth location, your date of birth, and your signature. However, if we look at these passport examples across different countries, you can see that even though they all contain the same data, it isn't always in the same format. And one of the biggest cases for this can be seen with date of births and date of passport expiry. I think the right way of displaying a date has probably been a debate on all of our engineering teams. And it looks like the Global Passport Office haven't quite come to an agreement on this one yet either. Some countries have all numerical based dates, some have a four digit year, some only have a two digit year. Some of the dates are text based and again this varies across different languages. But one thing we know for sure that is consistent universally on passports is this field at the bottom called an MRZ, which is a machine readable zone that you might not have even noticed before at the bottom of your passport. From the diagram on the screen, you can see that we can identify all key passport information from this zone. So we can identify your passport number, the issuing country, 
your full name, date of birth and date of expiry. Since we know that all of the data in this zone is going to be in a standardized format, it makes it a really good place for us to start basing some automated checks off. It isn't enough for us to just verify that these fields are here. We also need to apply some logic to understand is the data in the right length? Is it the right format? If they're dates, are they valid dates? You'll also notice on this diagram a range of different check digits. So passports also have a checksum that can be calculated on each value the passport contains and one final checksum for a passport as a whole. This can be a huge indicator in fraudulent passports that look legitimate to the human eye, but the maths just doesn't quite work out right on them. So at the start of every single project comes that age old question, should we build our own solution or should we buy an existing service? When looking at our clients specific use cases and the checks that they required specifically within the construction industry, it was clear to see that there wasn't a one size fits all solution out there that we could have integrated with for these exact needs. This rings true for a lot of scenarios within the ID verification area of expertise, as there are such vast differences of document types across industries and across countries. By solving this problem using the next generation of automation, we are helping our client build trust and overall improve their security. So let's get into the tech behind it all, which I personally think is the most exciting part. As I've mentioned before, ID changes drastically across countries and even within sectors. So when building a platform for handling verification, it needed to be easily extendable. Ensuring these services could be decoupled and ran as a collection or independently was crucial. That's why we decided to build everything as independent microservices in an event driven manner to just really allow us to control and configure what checks are needed. So, for example, running different configurations of verification for different customers. So for all of our individual document verification services, we are using AWS Lambda. You can see on the example in the screen that there is an individual Lambda for each of our verification services. So we have a passport check Lambda, a driving license check Lambda, and a right to work check Lambda. Each of these Lambdas have their own machine learning logic to parse the documents and then performs verification on the details that they have retrieved. We chose Lambda because of their on-demand event-driven nature and they can be invoked by almost anything, including API Gateway, EventBridge, SQS, and much more. For this flow, you can see that we are using SQS. So our document validation processor Lambda will pull this SQS queue for new messages that contain verification configurations. The document verification processor then parses this message to understand what checks are needed and will then trigger the required lambdas for those checks. So this is an example of what the SQS message could look like. And at a closer look, you can see that we're just using Boolean values to be able to determine what checks are required and we're also including the document ID. So these documents will live in S3 and their ID can be passed to the individual lambdas to then fetch that document for processing. Going the lambda route has really allowed us to be flexible when adding new checks. In the example on the screen now, you can see that we have added an additional check-in service for proof of address. And we know by adding this additional service that we're not going to impact the individual business logic in any of our other checks. So it won't impact the passport checks, the driving license checks, um, as all of the logic is isolated. Having code that is easily extendable allows us to be more innovative and creative when it comes to development, as we know that there's less risk of side effects. The fact that Lambda is also managed means that we don't have to worry about scaling as it's handled for us. It also means that we can scale on a per verification service basis. So in an event where we have a lot of people who need passport checks, 
The passport service can scale to handle that load, but the driving license service can remain as is, as it's just not under that same amount of traffic or load. You might be thinking one document is not enough to prove someone is who they say they are. For example, when you open a new bank account, you typically have to show a few forms of ID. So maybe a form of photographic ID and maybe a recent utility bill for your proof of address. Overall, the more ID we have on a person, the surer we can be of their identity. When starting to work with multiple documents, we realized that we needed to run continuity checks across them. In the example on the screen, you can see a passport and a driving license. At first glance, the pictures kind of look similar and we can see that they're both for a John Doe. However, at a closer look, you can see that the driving license is actually for a John Doe Smith and both of the date of births do not match. This is the case in a lot of fraud stories where criminals have been able to steal a lot of different forms of identification, but they don't all match for the same person. Therefore, we extended the service to be able to pull and track key information from these documents so that we could then do a cross comparison against everything associated with that user at the end. Although when it comes to continuity checks, there can be a lot of edge cases um, even take me, for example, at the minute, I've got a different name across different documents and for different scenarios like this, we still do have a human fallback that can do manual verification um, as there's a range of different edge cases that can happen when it comes to continuity and cross comparisons. So since these services deal with the collection and processing of personally identifiable information, PII, Security has always been a major factor in all of our infrastructure decisions. This has meant working with virtual private clouds to define and control our own networking, allowing us to define our own IP ranges for subnets and control our routing between services and access to the internet. With a lot of our services living within the VPC, we also have been able to take advantage of AWS Private Link. So AWS Private Link allows some of the AWS resources to communicate with resources that live inside of our VPC without actually exposing the data to the public internet, which overall helps protect us from a number of common attacks. Encryption also comes into play, both in transit and at rest. And for this, we utilize AWS KMS to ensure that any document stored for processing is stored in encrypted buckets. Something that we've also considered is the different data laws per country. An example in the EU would be the right to be forgotten law. If you're unfamiliar with the law, it basically means that customers have the right to ask companies to delete all existing data that they store on them. So when building this, we were ensuring that the system would have the ability to cater for this and any other data or identity requirement of the countries that we operate in. So this project is still ongoing and we are learning all of the time. Moving validation to be digital does not mean that we can just fully alleviate all human error. Since a lot of the documents that we're running for validation on are physical documents, it means that we still need to retrieve a picture from the user, and this has led to issues like these. So when people are taking a picture of their ID, most people tend to hold the ID from the bottom. And in pictures like this, you can see that holding it from the bottom, their thumb is covering a large section of their MRZ, which has an impact on our automated checks. Depending on devices and lighting, we've also seen some images that are just such bad quality that we're unable to process them. A lot of ID tends to be glossy and it can also be prone to bad light reflections or glare, depending on the lighting in the room or even if the user has used flash. And lastly, my personal favorite photo I have seen when somebody has been asked to take a photo of their passport has been this. I mean, I guess they're not wrong. That is definitely a picture of a passport, but ultimately we're not able to run our verification checks on this. 
So these are just some issues that we have seen so far around our upload process and some of the ideas that we have been considering for the next iteration on this project would be introducing things like real-time coaching for the end users through camera guidelines so that whenever they're taking the picture, they know what area of their document that we need the photo of, or even instant feedback on an image if it's too bad a quality for us to process. For either of these, we would need to have a different architecture flow from our verification services, as these would need to be real-time and synchronous to the user. It could even lead to us having a really super lightweight client-side machine learning model for identifying these bad quality images. For the future, as we start to build out more verification services, we may also need to start looking into step functions as complexity will continue to grow between these lambdas and the introduction of step function state machines might really benefit us at scale. So the future of ID verification. As we look into the future, a clear milestone that any identity company is going to need to face is building consumer trust. A recent survey from, help from a recent survey from the Global Cyber Security Awareness um, discovered that one in three people in the USA have been victim of identity fraud. As more services like this begin to be released that require users to upload their personal documents, it does start to create risks. As every new service that you upload your details to increases your risks exponentially of that data being leaked. So what can consumers look for to ensure that these services are trustworthy? As I mentioned before, something that we're already starting to see in the UK is accreditations in this area of expertise. The UK's Identity Trust Framework allows companies to hold identity services to a certain standard and allows business owners to understand what acceptable levels of identity confidence is required for their different scenarios. I foresee a lot more official bodies and com compliance standards appearing around this area of expertise worldwide in the coming years. Since the UK is an early adopter for a lot of standards around identity and data protection, if you are building a service to be compliant with UK laws, you might actually get compliance of other companies out of the box. Something else I could see advancements in is identity providers. When starting a new remote job, joining a new social media or facilitating online purchasing, if more and more of these services start requiring you to upload your identity documents to verify who you are, it does start to create a lot more effort and annoyance. People don't want to be doing this every single time you create a new account. Overall, consumers want convenience and privacy, while business owners need to know who they're letting through the door. This is why I could see more OAuth providers fully integrating with ID services meaning that users only need to upload their personal documents to one secure place, and they can then log into other platforms with these already verified accounts. The individual services then know that if a user logged in with that account type, that they are valid. Although you might be thinking if this centralization of personal data is ethical or not, and maybe if there could be a role for Web3 here. But what does all of this mean for physical ID? I don't think it's safe to say that we can fully move to digitally verify every type of document and that there will be no need for manual checks ever again. We don't live in a fully digitally literate society. And so some form of manual intervention or fallback will still be required. For example, when it comes to UK government checks, users who are not tech savvy can go to their local post offices to be able to fill out forms and have their verification done manually. As we move into the future, having services like this in place will still be necessary, as it's estimated that nearly one in four people in the UK have no form of traditional ID credentials. Some countries have already started moving to digitally or to move into using digitally digital ID cards and eliminating physical photographic ID for nationality. I can see an increase in this across other countries in the future, 
but even if the ID is digital, there will still need to be some form of logic to apply to it for us to be able to verify its authenticity. So with the introduction of new verification methods and IDs such as digital ones, what does this mean for the past? At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned some of the earliest forms of ID that seem ridiculous now. For example, the idea of using jewellery to identify a person seemed crazy. But to this day, we are still technically using it in the form of dog tags for military personnel and even medical alert bracelets. With this in mind, I do feel like a lot of our traditional forms of ID are here for another while, but I could see them becoming more of an aid for verification and not a whole measure. That's all I have on ID verification, but one final note I would love to leave you on is some information about the Global AWS Community Builder Program. I have been a member of this program from its initial beta back in 2020, and I have learned so much around building with AWS services from being part of this program that has helped me when it came to architecting this latest solution. The program provides a lot of webinars on new services, on architecture, and even on career enhancement. One of my personal highlights from being part of this community is getting to speak at AWS reInvent in Las Vegas this year and getting the opportunity to meet some of my fellow community builders in person. Overall, some of the core benefits include AWS promotional credits, vouchers for certification, direct access to AWS product teams for questions and support, early access to preview services, and most importantly, getting the opportunity to meet people who are passionate about learning like you. So I would advise anyone who's looking to advance their career in building and working with AWS resources to look into this community for help and support. I have included the link at the bottom of the slide. Applications for the current cycle have closed, but you can add your name to the waitlist at the minute and the next cycle of applications should be opening around July or August time. So thank you all so much for listening. I hope you find this interesting and I hope that you've learned something new. I do have a blog version of this, of this talk. If you are interested in reading more about it, you can scan the QR code on the slide. I also have my Twitter and LinkedIn handles here. So if you would like to connect with me and chat about any of this further. And my the last account there is my Medium account. So if you are interested in cloud, I do write some blogs on some of the stuff that I'm working on. So if you're interested, I have a range of blogs on different side projects. I have some blogs on study notes for AWS certifications and also just some general tips and advice. And if anyone has any questions, I am happy to take them now. Or if you'd rather reach out to me personally, I'm also happy to take questions over Twitter or LinkedIn. But thank you all so much for, for listening. And I really hope you did learn something and find it interesting. Thank you so much, Chloe, for presenting on ID verification. It was really, really amazing. And I'm sure we all learned so much. I know several people mentioned how smart and knowledgeable you were on the subject. So <clears throat> while everyone's sharing their questions, like, like Chloe said, feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat. I saw a couple in there um, that I'll ask. But if anyone has additional questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, and then we're going to go ahead. I have, like I said, a couple that people did ask. Um, Takina, she was curious if you think rapid use of smartphones also play into ID verification. Yeah, so I think with the increase of people using smartphones, it definitely does fall into <coughs> a lot of the issues that we're seeing around capturing the photos of the identity documents themselves. So having smarter measures in place for us to ensure that we can have guidelines for people taking their images, making sure that we can be as user friendly as possible, because a lot of people using these services aren't going to be maybe on a desktop having their files ready to upload. We need to have that nearly native camera first approach to make these processes as quick and easy for a user as possible, that it's not an, an inconvenience every time that you need to do this. And even just the increase of having more accounts, like we said throughout the, the slide there, that the more accounts that you are creating, you really do increase your risk exponentially of having your data leaked somewhere. 
So, you know, limiting those accounts and making sure that we may be doing single sign into things and having like one account instead of multiple can also be better as well. Um, in terms of the future of the industry of kind of identification and the idea that it could potentially go fully digital at some point um, in the future, uh, what would be the process of keeping that digital identification? So if someone did start to progress into having, you know, maybe a predominantly digital identification, what would be the process for keeping that digital identification secure um, and ensuring that it wasn't going to be, you know, hacked or go to the wrong, the wrong information, anything like that. Yeah, definitely. That's such an interesting convers conversation. And it's definitely something that I, I love to think about. You know, we're already starting to see some of these digital ID cards coming in for, for different countries around the world. And I do think there's going to be such a big movement towards that in the future of having more and more companies or countries get involved with having those digital ID cards, whether it's for national nationality, whether it's for driving license, whether it is for, um, I don't know, just specific other forms of identity, depending on your, your company or your industry that you're in. And security definitely does come into play there. Like, you know, I can have my passport hidden in a cupboard in my house and, and know that somebody would need to break in to steal it. But when it comes to having these digital, digital cards, there needs to be a mechanism in place for us to to securely store them. So whether if they are government issued, if there are special government accounts that we would have for them, if there is some form of encryption vaults or secret storage areas that we're able to put these in to make sure that we're doing as much as we possibly can to protect them. And hopefully then with the introduction of digital cards as well, there will be an extra layer of, of security around their checksums or check digits, how they're actually being generated, that they will be less easily to, to create fraudulent versions or copies of compared to some of their kind of physical counterparts. Awesome. With, with people who are on this call that may be looking to get into um, you know, ID verification um, or increasing security, things like that, cybersecurity measures. Um, what are some tools and resources that you found that help you stay up to date on trends in the industry? For me, I am such a big fan of blogs. <laughs> you probably noticed from all of my blog links and Medium account links there. So I do, like, I really do enjoy just having my morning coffee and looking off a, a blog around the topic that I'm, I'm researching at that current period in time. For me, I kind of accidentally sort of fell into ID verification. It wasn't an area I've always specialized in. And, um, you know, I have just been more of a general full stack software engineer. And ever since I've been working with this client, finding out more and more about security, verification, authentication, and IDs, I have found so incredibly interesting. So I would definitely recommend anyone who is interested in this to to go to Medium or to just go to generally different blogging websites. There's so many fascinating things around the history of ID. That's why I did include that we timeline at the start. I thought it's so interesting to see where we came from and where we've ended up today with all of those dramatic changes in how we actually verify different individuals and people. So definitely keep up to date with them and feel free to follow me. I'm a wee bit of a nerd with ID verification at the minute, so I will be posting out more content on it and that you're you're more than welcome to, to follow and read. Absolutely. I personally loved the, the part where you were going through the history timeline as a little bit of a history buff. I think I popped in the chat. It, um, it was so interesting to me. I was like, I could listen to this all day. <laughs> well, that's good to know. It's not uh, just me. I always get worried when I'm creating slides that I'm the only person who finds them interesting. <laughs> no, I think it was great. And I think it really set up the talk for, for you know, what we're into now, because I think that's so true that there is so much changing and so much is going virtual. And it's like, if we're using certain things, where we're uploading our identification. How do we know if it's safe? How do we know if it's not safe? And um, you know, what can be hacked. So I think this is such a pertinent topic. I think this is a topic that's only going to continue to grow and advance and the conversations are going to continue around it. And so, you know, I just want to thank you for, again, for coming uh, and sharing this information with the Women Who Code community today. I want to thank um, everyone who asked a question. Um, and, and again, big thank you to Chloe for taking your time. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this session.